Hi there, everybody. It's Zane with Sailing Views, and I have a longtime friend, mentor, and someone who I've always idolized. This is Greg Fisher. Um, well, with that, how are you doing, Greg? I'm good, Zane. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, you know, I've sailed against you for years since I was a kid in Flying Scots, uh, and then I've been following you and bumping into you in boats like J-22s and pretty much everything. Um, and now I'm glad to, personally to see you coaching and staying active and doing everything you can. Uh, so with all that, you're coaching now. So how's that going for you? Well, it's good. I love it. I, um, you know, I did the North Sales. Um, I was a sailmaker for 35 years and I was with North Sales for almost the last 20. And I left and became the sailing director at the College of Charleston, which was a blast. I loved it. And um, though I wasn't a head coach because we had two really great coaches, I did a lot of coaching with the gang mm -hmm. and loved that. Um, and I left that after eight years and became the COO of the Olympic team. And uh, while I enjoyed that, and uh, it was certainly a challenge, the part I enjoyed the most is when I was able to go to the Pan Am Games with the team as a coach with Malcolm Page and Leandro Spina, and that was a ton of fun. And, and it was shortly after that that I resigned to become a full-time coach. Yeah. And, um, and I love that. I was able to do some last fall and this winter, but of course, it, um, it took a halt come March. Yeah. But looking forward to when things start up again and, you know, hopefully get back at it. Yeah, I think we all are right now. You know, yeah. I, I was really hoping that it was starting to clear up and uh, now we've got a second wave starting to hit and it's like, okay, I'll just stay in my little boat yard and keep myself safe. But, yeah. Uh, all right, well, yeah. let me go ahead and dive into these questions. Uh, what age did you start sailing and where? Well, I was very lucky in that our family was really into sailing. My dad loved it. <clears throat> My brother and I uh, grew up in Columbus, Ohio, in the middle of the state. We sailed on a, I don't want to say a dinky little lake, but it certainly wasn't very big and um, um, grew up crewing from my dad and his lightning. And um, we had a great time taking turns, but it wasn't long before he got us our own boats and started crewing for us and um, got us into it by the time we were 12 and 14. And, uh, and then he gave up his own sailing to make sure we had the opportunity to pursue it. And um, looking back on that, we were really lucky. But he made sure we were able to do the junior stuff and we did lightning sailing and you know, got into the Sears Cup stuff, which was big then. And you know, just we were really lucky to have that kind of family support. And, um, and the clubs we sailed in were really big into youth sailing too. Yeah, well, that's always, a, you know, I, I come from, from a very small club and having, you know, support from the family and then the other members definitely helped me. Um, oh yeah, where you grew up, Zane, that's the kind of the epitome of what youth sailing and one design sailing is all about, that yep. whole Gulf Coast. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, just flying scots, sunfish, opties. I mean, there's a little bit of everything down here. So, you know, for me, yeah. I, I was lucky to sail in thistles, lightnings, Chrysler Buccaneers, you know, a little bit of everything. And then even one is on uh, perf boats, you know, it was good for me down here. It's a good place. Yeah. All sure right. Is. So what, who, who were some of your early influences? You know, you, you mentioned your dad and some of the people at the club, but who influenced you? Who made you good? Well, I was, my, like I say, my dad just worked super hard. And then, um, it's interesting, I had a very close friend who was basically my dad's best friend that I crewed for in Lightnings for many years, a guy named Jim Dressel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sailed with him and with he and his wife and probably three or four Lightning North Americans and, um, and enjoyed that, learned a lot. Um, he was very supportive and I still, he lives in Columbus still and um, still talk to him regularly and keep in touch. So, but he was very supportive and, um, and my brother was huge. We competed hard against each other, which sometimes doesn't always work out great, but for us it did. And right until college, we sailed against each other at, the, at our respective schools until my last year when I transferred 
to um, the same school. He was in Miami of Ohio, so we could sail on the same team. And that was fun. That was fun. Yeah. And, and we did the youth champs. I was fortunate to do the very first youth champs. Um, and Peter Komet was there and Dave Perry and, you know, a lot of that's that's my vintage that I grew up with. So it was fun to kind of maintain those friendships and and learn from those guys as well. Yeah. Now, you just mentioned Dave Perry. I'm actually been emailing and talking with him. He's coming up, I think, next. Uh, oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, great. And, you know, he's definitely taken the uh, kind of youth moniker and that youth champ group. And, you know, back when I was a kid, he was you know, the legendary rule master. And I mean, I guess he still is, but yeah, he, he has worked a lot with those youth champs and made it, you know, really big. Oh so. yeah. Yeah. He is an incredible coach and speaker. I got, to, he did quite a bit with the Olympic team and, uh, and I watched him at the world cup a couple of years ago, kind of do his thing and speak yeah. to him. And, you know, I, as everybody knows, he's incredibly talented and engaging and, um, uh, just a great guy. Yeah, super great guy. Smart as a whip, man. Yeah. All right. So uh, at what age did you think you were good? You know, and that you actually, okay, I'm good. I have a good shot. I need to keep going with it. Where? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I, even at this ripe old age, I, I'm convinced <laughs> that I am. But, um, you know, I know what I enjoy for sure. And, uh, and I know that the cool thing about this sport is that we're always learning. There's always something new to to try and experiment with. And, um, and so that, and when I'm coaching, you know, frankly, that's what turns me on the most is when you kind of have another aha moment. And if you're able to share that with the people you're working with, then it's really cool and special. And everybody goes, wow, we really just learned a ton right there. So, um, so you're always learning. Um, I, I will say, and this is maybe a little bit off topic, but, um, what made a big difference in my career is when I started sailing with my wife, who um, Joanne and I were married 2002. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she loves sailing probably even more than I do. She still does a great deal of it. And we sailed hard together for 10, 12 years. Yeah. And, um, and that changed my career. I think not only did, were we able to do better, we had a lot of fun, lot, had a lot more fun. And frankly, I think that came first and that helped us sail better. But, you know, so there's a bunch of things that I learned from that is first, you got to make sure you're having a great time. That'll help you perform better. And two, um, if you can be with somebody that loves the sport as much as you do, and you're able to, to go to the events together, that's special. And, and then sailing with people you enjoy racing with is, is crucial too. Yeah. Sorry, that was a mouthful. No, but dude, that, <laughs> it was that, it was a turning point for me in the sport for sure. Oh yeah, I mean that's perfect. Um, you know, I growing up, you know, sailing flying scots. I remember when the tight rig came in and you first helped usher it in, and then I know once uh, you brought it to Gulfport and kind of cleaned everybody's clocks. And I think I, you know, I was pretty young at the time, but I know down here on the Gulf Coast, we really took what you had taught us and changed everything we were doing we all started sail testing and rig testing and then we changed everything uh you know have you always influenced things like that in different classes come in and just kind of shaking everything up or was that really a well well first I, I will say you know when we went down to the regattas and there were plenty of them obviously on the gulf coast big flying scott events from the midwinters of panama city and and North Americans at Southern and Gulfport and I mean, Bay Waveland, it, it, it's just, you know, it's always been a great spot for Flank Scott sailing. But I, I certainly learned a lot from your gang as well and um, had a ton of fun sailing with Mark Egan. He and I sailed together. He crewed for me in a Lightning North American. So I think I crewed for him and probably three Flank Scott North Americans. And, um, and then uh, we sailed in North Americans in Gulfport and got cleaned out really well by John Dane. So clearly he's, he's, um, he's pretty he's, plenty speedy and yeah. all the sailing he does. Yeah, but I special. think I've always enjoyed seeing, making boats go fast. You know, I think, you know, being a sailmaker, that was, um, an important part of that and always experimenting. And, and the fact that I was lucky to be able to sail with people like, 
Mark and and sail against people like John Dane and and uh, you know Donnie and people like that that you had down there that were really tough. You always had the opportunity to experiment with things like that. Yeah. And um, and then of course my brother and Lightnings, you know, we were willing to try stuff and he would never be afraid to say that didn't work, you know, yeah. <laughs> but, but I, I think it's one of those deals. You always have to keep trying new things and, um, and, you know, and know when it's time to move on and try something different. Yeah. Speaking of different, have you tried foiling yet? I've watched a lot of it, you know, mm-hmm. here at the college, um, a lot of kids on the team are really into it. And, uh, our doc master, I think it was four years ago. And I think he still holds, the world speed record in his moth. Um, his name's Ned Goss. I'm pretty sure he still holds it. And, you know, he had his Lhasa Tech all fired up in it for 10 seconds. I forget how fast he's going, but it was incredibly quick until he had the mother of all crashes at the end. <laughs> yeah. But he said, well, that was fun. But yeah. but I've watched it a lot and I've I've enjoyed it, but I've not done it myself. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I've seen it, but yeah, I don't know if I could recover from a crash. So yeah, they have some pretty good ones. That's for sure. <laughs> yes, they do. All right. So, uh, what is your favorite boat? Now I know you've been in a ton of them. So, what's your favorite boat and why? Well, you know, obviously that's a loaded question, and and um, there are a lot of great boats out there, and I love the Flying Scott because it was a very tactical boat, and I could sail with my wife, or I could sail with my wife and my daughter you know i think the boats are all equal i think there's a lot to be said for that um i also enjoyed the j22 a ton um you know it was a quick little boat um you had a keel boat and again sailing with the family was um was great um i grew up in the lightning so that boat will always be special and um, another boat that i always had a great time in was a thistle you know I don't think there's still a boat to this day that's as fast and light air as a thistle, and you might say as challenging and heavy air as it is. And um, and uh, but I guess the part that all of those classes that I enjoy, and and you know, as well as Zane, that the people make it, you know, and they're all fun people in those classes. And to me, that's what it's all about. You know, when you go to a thistle regatta or you go to a flying Scott regatta, you know, the parties, the times together are just as much fun as the sailing and it's a shame that that's the part that we're going to miss here for a while yep. you know? yeah exactly. so but i enjoy them all you know and um you know I, I still have a lightning um and we still sail that from time to time but um you know i've been lucky to sail a bunch of them i guess the other person you know i, I mentioned my wife and how much fun i had sailing with her and what that meant to my career and then um, another person that i sailed with who I was sailing with in Flying Scots when we got to know each other was Jeff Iber. And he worked yeah. at my sail loft when he was like 15. Mm-hmm. And we sailed together for literally 34 years. And uh, someone said we're like a couple little ladies in the boat sailing <laughs> together. Yeah. But, but he sailed me in all those different flavors of boats. And then with Joanne. So, you know, again, I was lucky to be able to sail with people I really had fun with. That is always a good thing. All right. Um, so, what is your favorite place to sail? Then, I know you've traveled a lot. So, well, there are a bunch of cool spots. Um, <laughs> I got to say, we love Charleston. It's a neat yeah. spot, and uh, for this Ohio Inland Lake boy to come to Charleston, where the current sometimes is cruising around at three knots, that's been a thrill to learn that new part of sailboat racing with the current. Yeah. Um, but it's a great spot to sail here. But I gotta say, probably one of my favorites is uh, sorry, mailman's here. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> is the uh, Buffalo Canoe Club. Really? Um, yeah, that's that, there's a huge Lightning fleet there. Uh, I think they've that. Well, they had the World Championships for the Lightnings, and as recent as 2014 and uh, or 15, and it's just a great spot <clears throat> to sail. You know, fresh water. The breeze is always in, and um, Again, people are great, but it just is, it's just a great spot to sail lightnings. You know, you wet sail the boats, anchor them out. And, um, and again, the people are great there too. 
Yeah. But there's a lot of places that are great. San Diego is fun. You know, <clears throat> I've done a lot of snipe sailing and thistle sailing on Mission Bay, you know, and that's like an inland lake right on the ocean, you know, so the sea breeze comes in and it's beautiful. Yeah. You know, it's like the boats. I think they're all a little bit different. Yeah. They're all, they're all definitely different. Some are definitely have, you know, it's almost like there's never a perfect place. You know, this place is great for sailing, but the harbor getting, getting in and out of the harbor is bad. Or this place has a great harbor, but the sailing's not, you know, yeah. there's always some little trade-off. Yeah. All right. So, uh, where do you see the future of sailing going right now? I mean, do you see well, it moving into foiling or just back to one design or what are your thoughts on it? Well, first, I, I think there's there are a lot of people that feel the sports, I don't know how else to say it, in trouble, you know? Yeah. But I've been fortunate to be exposed to college sailing a lot this past eight to 10 years. And I'm still on the executive committee of college sailing on the organization. And, um, and high school sailing is doing well. I've been exposed to that. My daughter's doing a little bit of that, but I, you know, I, I just think that those two organizations are on a roll and college sailing is super strong. You know, there's almost 200 teams um, across the country. Um, and I, I, th I want to say over 3000 sailors. So there is a market there and, and, and you know, despite what a lot of people say about how intense it is and it takes the fun out of it, it's not the case, you know, and there are a lot of kids that are coming out of college sailing that want to continue sailing. And I think the challenge is um, a lot of them are starting careers <clears throat> and don't have necessarily the dough to go buy a boat or uh, join a yacht club or whatever. So I think the sport's changing to accommodate them. You know, mm -hmm. we see a lot of yacht club team racing. Southern's into that big with their soil and cup and, um, you know, uh, Newport Harbor Yacht Club, New York Yacht Club, San Diego, all host these yacht club events where there are boats for the sailors to come sail. And, um, and I think that is going to give more and more of an opportunity. So I, I think, you, you ask about foiling. I think foiling is for sure really cool. And, um, and for that group that just wants to go wicked fast, I think it's, it's, it's huge. I think there are people though that want to still race super competitively, not to say for one minute foiling's not, but obviously it's different. And the lightning class, um, you know, certainly represents a, a huge contingent of college age kids that are coming into it. Um, and people also talk a lot about professional sailing. And when I went and did a fair bit of coaching this winter, the, the pros that we see are college kids that have recently graduated or still maybe are college sailors in some ways. Yeah. So they're still able to sail and support their habit that they love by being a professional. So it, I think that market is is there in college sailing, for example, is so strong and the racing is so solid and the social part of it is is so um, such a great opportunity for these sailors, too, that it's going to continue to grow. And, and the college sailing organization is doing everything they can to help make that happen. So I guess in a long, windy way, saying I'd say I think the sport is really healthy yeah. and I think that market is ready to be catered to. And um, and I think if there's one thing I'd love to see one design classes do even more of is providing opportunities for these sailors or, or yacht clubs to provide more opportunities for these sailors with fleets, you know, of boats that they can come sail and maybe reduced memberships that yeah. are cost and memberships so they can actually join and continue sailing and a number of clubs are really doing this newport Har newport harbor yacht club in uh, newport beach california is like the epitome of working hard to make it possible for those those kids that They're demographic fine. to continue to sail yeah well that's good for them all right so uh what's the best regatta or the best trip you've been on well, 
I think any regatta you go to is a great one. I'll start with that corny, uh, trite remark, but I think it is fun to go to. And, and it's, I haven't been out to many regattas um, since the virus, but I imagine that is a different feeling now because the social part is so small, part of it. You but got, I, you got to pick one, man. Come on, just pick yeah. one that just well, stands out. There would be the, the J22 Worlds in Rochester in 2008. You know, it's just so, it was a big regatta. I think there were 110 boats. Yeah. It was, you know, it seemed like all our friends were there. All our friends and their wives were there sailing. Um, it was great sailing, challenging, but it was a ton of fun. And I sailed with my wife and um, Jeff Iber, the guy yeah. I told you about earlier, and it, it, we had a great time. It was fun. All right. Now, I've had many a trips where I've broken down halfway through or, or broken mass or T-bone boats. You know, I've had just disastrous regattas. What's one of your big disasters or your worst regattas? Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you an embarrassing moment I had where um, we sailed, I think it was the Lightning Masters Worlds, which was at the Buffalo Canoe Club right before the World Championship. So we had that sort of as our practice regatta, if you will. And that was about the best we could call it for us and fortunately we were able to kind of get our act together for the worlds but it was interesting um first i think it was the first race is light air we got off the starting line okay crossing tacks with boats and um i was dipping this boat on starboard and i needed it to be a real close duck because i had a boat on our hip behind us mm -hmm. and both jeff and my wife joanne said you got this. We're kind of tight here. You got this. And it's like, oh, I got this. So, but anyway, I plowed right in to the side of that boat. Oh. Maybe I was close to the transom, but I still nailed him. Mm -hmm. Happened to be my brother, oh, which God. compounded the deal. Uh -huh. and, um, and we evidently, even though it was only blowing about five, so it was super quiet. So it wasn't like nobody missed it. Yeah. And um, But I put a nice hole in the bow, in the tank down below the, mm. so as we're sailing, we filled up with water yeah. and had to drop out. So when the builder was fixing that boat that night, he was fixing it in front of everybody at the cocktail party. Oh, yeah. So everybody's standing there with the drink, watching him mm -hmm. fix our boat, knowing that we ran into my brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it was those, fun. That's what are, it's all about. Yeah, those are the good ones when you can uh, stand around in front of the, the group of everybody while they're dr sipping at the keg and uh, yeah, just laughing yeah. at you the whole time. Yeah, exactly. It's I've fun seen to get be that, that a lot. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, but anyway, that was, and I and we all have those, and I probably have ten more that I could say, but yeah, I won't forget that one for sure. <laughs> I got you. Okay, well here's a here's one of my interesting questions. Uh, what's the strangest thing you've seen floating in the water? Oh, man. Well, once we're, um, I can't think of anything that would be strange, but we were, um, say, on the Thistle Midwinters and Wild Plain, and we were in pretty good shape, and there was like a handful of boats right behind us. And as we're planing downwind, and Jeff is flying the spinnaker, he yells, Pelican. And I, <laughs> had no idea what he's talking about. Turns out there was a pelican in the water right in front of us. And I know I didn't hit it, but we got very close to it. Yeah. So the rest of that regatta, I won't tell you what we're called regarding pelicans, but it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a good thing. Yeah. Somebody pasted the picture of a pelican on our transom. And uh, anyway, that was, again, another embarrassing one. Yeah. But I swear we missed them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm used to pelicans. They don't bother me at all. Uh, That's right. Yeah. All right. So uh, do you consider yourself aggressive or conservative when you're sailing? Because, you know, some people are like down here in the south, you know, we are just hyper aggressive. You know, northeast to me seems a mix. West coast seems super conservative. What's your style? What do you think? Well, <clears throat> my wife would say clearly my emotion in the boat is aggressive mm -hmm. and she might say offensive at times <laughs> but I, I push it hard but my tactical style if you will is exceptionally conservative and i think maybe 
that's why I focus so hard on boat speed, because if you have good speed, then you can afford to be um, conservative looser. in your yeah. style. And, you know, that's interesting. Going back to our college sailing program, you know, we we worked really hard to make sure our team was fast. And there's only so many things you can do when you're all sailing exactly the same boats. Mm -hmm. But still, we practice that a lot so that we could be very conservative, you know, and like start in the middle of the line and rarely get out of the middle two thirds of the weather leg, you know, so you would never, you might not round in the top two or three at the top mark, but you're always in it, you know. So anyway, I'd, I'd say I I'm a very conservative suit. I would call that conservative. You know, I don't really consider myself slow in any boats, but every time I go to the middle, I just see people wrap up, wrap me up on both sides. And it always happens. And I've, I've for, for myself, and it could just be sailing down here in the south or just how I position myself on, on the, the, the stage of the winds, but every time I get near the middle, I get gobbled up. Um, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, know. you know, I think, Zane, it's one of those deals when you play that game and you're in the middle, you know, where you're going to lead boats back to the middle that comes from the side. And, and I don't mean like you're just going to stay in the middle and watch the sides end up 200 yards away from you. You're going to basically, like I say, lead back to the middle. But you got to know that you're going to lose some boats that mm -hmm. shoot the corner and are fortunate to shoot the right corner. Yeah. But I think the point is if we're speedy enough around the race course, then we can hopefully, as they do that again and again, and maybe don't hit it right, they fade back. And if we're in the if we're conservative and consistent, maybe is the more important term too to throw in there, then at the end we'll be in good shape. Yeah, you know, I did a- That's I, easier I, said than done too, it, for it sure. It is, <laughs> it is. You know, I did a uh, regatta with uh, Naomi Vandenberg, who we were talking about earlier. Um, mm -hmm. We were doing a Rose 19 regatta and we had more speed than anybody out there and it was obvious. I mean, just blatantly obvious. Uh, we start the committee boat, literally roll the whole fleet and as I'd roll them, they'd tack out. I'd tack on their hip. The problem is sailing in Chicago, they would all, everybody I tacked over and just outrun, they would all go hard right, catch some crazy ship and be 300 yards ahead of me at the mark. I'm like, oh, geez. I'm like, okay. So this happened to me like four races in a row. And finally I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna win the boat and tack. I don't quit trying to prove my speed dominance by rolling them. Sure enough, I won the next, that race by like a leg and a half, you know, it was like, okay, I finally get clear and get to see what they were doing. And yeah. So, yeah, you know, no, that's, that's, that's part of the conservativeness in me where, okay, you know, just roll everybody tack on top of them. No reason to tack off, off the start unless I needed to. Okay. That's where conservative bit me in the butt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you got to know when to hang it out there too, you know, and, uh, you're right. You could overdo that. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So let's speed through some of these here. Um, what's the best maneuver, single maneuver you pulled off? Port, is it port tack and a start? Uh, you know, great mark rounding. You got any good stories for that? Well, <clears throat> I, ha I have one at a, at a Flying Scott North Americans with a good friend, Brian Hayes, who you know that works yeah. for North. He and I sailed together a lot in Flying Scott's. We are doing our basic port tack approach and we had a boat right behind us and a raft of boats on star starboard and it all closed up in the last 15 seconds or when they were for us to go and and uh, i think we knew that a big collision was imminent and somehow it opened up just enough that we we're able to sneak in there and uh, and get lined up for a good start but it looked like we were going to do some serious damage to everybody yeah. and not be very friendly so that was um <clears throat> that was one yeah but I'm... our first, i will say an embarrassing one for our very first flank scott regatta saying we went to the midwinters in sanders bay and you know how the trailers i don't know if they're still like this but they used to be kind of tongue light and if oh, yeah. you went to the but, yeah. so somebody had unhooked the cranker deal from the bow that kept the boat on the trailer. So when I walked to the back to get something underneath the back deck, the tongue went up and the boat launched right off the trailer into the parking lot. Our very first regatta. So it was, we were very, uh, 
impressed with ourselves. And I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. And there, with one, only one hoist, it's not like you had a whole lot of free time to leave it hanging and fix everything. You know. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, but we made a lot of friends to put it back on the trailer. So yeah, I, I bet there's a did. lot of way to make buddies at a regatta. That yeah. probably is not the best way. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. All right, so uh, America's Cup, what do you think? Do you love it? Do you hate it? What are your thoughts on it? Well, I, th <clears throat> I think it's amazingly cool. The boats they're sailing are incredible machines, you know, and um, and a number of the people that are sailing on them I got to know a little bit because a lot of them are members of the U.S. sailing team. But to be honest with you, it's hard for me to identify with that. You know, it's just a different kind of sail. You know, I mean, flank has got J-22, Thistle, Lightning, even J-70 is so different from that kind of sailing. And, um, you know, and the technical aspects of it, it's hard to identify it. But is it good for the sport? I think it it is interesting to people outside of sailing to kind of say wow this is wild to watch mm -hmm. and uh, i remember our <laughs> our plumber of all things um two america's cups ago was watching it and just was so wound up on it and so happy that the u.s were coming back and they were going to win you know and it's just interesting he wasn't any type of a boater let alone a sailor yet he got in interested and excited yeah. with that but for me i i have a hard time identifying with it and um, as much as i'd love to be around it more it's yeah. just different you know it, it's cool it, it's cool it's it's all about the engineering and the designers which is just it's over my head but mm. yeah. all right so, so uh what are your future plans in sailing I mean, are you just going to be coaching or are you going to try to do some regattas? What, what are your plans? I, you know, I'd love to do some more sailing, especially in the lightning. Like I say, we still have it and my wife loves it um, too. But I think um, coaching is going to be more where I focus. I think I just enjoy that so much more to help other people sail faster and um, to do that with two or three boats or with a group is exciting. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to get a position this year um, as the class coach for the IC37. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we'll be able to enjoy that much because of the virus, especially up in the Northeast. But we've done a no number of webinars, and um, that's been fun to be involved with. But um, you know, I especially enjoy that kind of coaching and that kind of sailing, you know, where you have a group that you're working with and you're helping that entire group benefit, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I enjoy that. I'd love to do some more lightning sailing, but I also realize that you have to put the time in to be competitive. Sorry, mailman's making a second return. Yeah. So you have to put the time in to prepare, you know, and, um, and it's funny, as I got out of sail making into my time with the College of Charleston and U.S. sailing, and I sailed less and less, it became harder and harder to compete. And it just, mm -hmm. it was hard to go there and kind of do a halfway job. Mm -hmm. So I will have to make sure I, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to put the time in to apply myself and get set up. Yeah. See, so, yeah, I quit sailing. Yeah, I don't know if you remember, but from 2007 to uh, about... I don't know. It's about 10, 11 years I didn't sail um, at really? all. At, I mean, at all. I think my last regatta was either 2007 or 2008. And I won a regatta, packed out my boat, never touched it again. And just flat out stopped cold turkey, didn't sail. And me coming back, it's so difficult. And I find myself so rusty. And I know how to physically do it. I know what I'm mentally supposed to do. But I just can't get it all to jive and, and connect the dots. So yeah. I'm getting a little well, better. You know, but. You're right. Practices. And I think that's the part about the coaching thing that I like is encouraging people to really go out and just plain old practice practice, whether it's working on their speed or their boat handling. But then you can really see a difference, of course, you know, and, oh, yeah. and it applies to us, too. Unfortunately, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to try to be competitive. We got to put that time in. I agree. All you right. Can't fake it. <laughs> yeah. No, you definitely can't. All right. So, uh, what can we do with women sailing or what do you think about it or do you have any ideas on it 
Well, I think that is a huge part of our sport. And, I, you know, there's clearly things that we can always do to help improve it. But first, I would love to say, I think we sort of need to appreciate that there's a lot of good stuff going on. Going back to college sailing, uh, as you can tell, I'm high on college sailing. <laughs> but, you know, you figure in college sailing, there's a men's single-handed and a women's single-handed. There's the match race championships. A woman has to be on the boat. There's a women's nationals as well as a co-ed national. So it's not just women's and men's and, um, and a team race nationals and starting this next year and then moving forward, I think 2021 is when they want to really hope to have the first women's team race nationals mm -hmm. um, is our women's team race regatta. So again, Oh, you know, and like at our, team at the College of Charleston. I think 65% of our team was female, you know, great sailors, great people. And I think that's a huge part of it. So that market is there. And I just think more and more classes like the IC 37, like the Pan Am games where they require, require a women, woman on the boat. Um, you know, the classes you and I sales in like the Flank Scott and the Lightning almost everybody has a wife or girlfriend or a, a, a woman on the boat with them. Mm -hmm. I think more and more of that needs to be incorporated into it and be a part of it. Sure. And the only part that I would love to see us really, not the only part, but one of the most important parts to really work on is to find opportunities for really talented women to do more professional sailing because there, there's no question they're super talented and they have the ability that, that, that it's, mm -hmm. we shouldn't even, bring that up because that's not a question. I just would love to see them have that chance to do that more because yeah. they deserve it. Yeah. And, and that doesn't mean there aren't plenty of, you know, professional women sailors out there, but even more of that would be great. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, I've, I've interviewed several of them and uh, they've all said the same thing that, you know, they, they can get accepted on the boat. They get accepted uh, sailing, but it's hard for them to find that, that paying job which, you know, doesn't make any sense to me. It's like, you know, I'd much rather have a girl taking care of my boat and cleaning it up. Now, if I could ever afford one, it'd be another thing. But, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that's that's the economics for me. But, um, yeah. yeah, women are more detail-oriented. They're just better at clean up all the loose ends, that, especially a guy like me that just has crap scattered everywhere. You know, I would think that uh, a female would be great in that respect. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's move on to uh, any ideas on how to grow the sport beyond what we've already mentioned and brought up? Well, I just, you know, it's interesting to see what obviously I know you watch uh, and read Scuttlebutt with Craig Lewick and what he's talking about and the importance of keeping it fun, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I, I think people need to recognize that um, there constantly need to, needs to be um, attention given to the group below that, shall we say, the most experienced yeah. third, top third. That group needs to be um, catered to, sounds like the wrong way to put it, but they need to be given the attention to help them improve. Yeah. And most important, the social part of it, everybody needs to come together. And, and I know you've seen a lot of these classes that are experts at that and, and do everything they can to, to encourage or require the social part of it where everybody's together. So it doesn't have anything to do with being on the race course that you're going to get to know everybody. Mm -hmm. I think that's really valuable. So I think that's an important part of it. Yeah. And, um, and it's interesting. I will say I, 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 like I said, I did some coaching in some of the professional ranks, and I was impressed with how much socializing there was still going on or how much fun people were still having together. And, and it was probably unfair to me to assume that it was different, but when I got there, I was um, pleasantly surprised and um, you know, pleased to see where it's going. So I think see, as long as people keep that mindset that we got to make sure that people are enjoying it. And it's the same thing with like college sailing and all that. People still have to just plain old, plain old enjoy, mm -hmm. you know, the whole process of working hard like they do. 
you know yeah um now i think it's important yeah now i i race uh the Melges a lot and a bunch of other you know hot little boats where there's just full of pros and i have to disagree with you a little bit on that simply because a lot of the pro guys i go to uh and big boat professional regattas it just all these regattas where all the pros are they're so program oriented and you know because i mean it's their job it's their living they get off the boat they pack it up they might have a drink but then they're gone you know and, and it's literally they have one one or two cocktails talking with their other pros and then they disappear and to me that just drives me batty it's like come on yeah. socialize spend more time you know i don't know but i think no, the social I, I, aspects that's you. part you know. You're right. I mean, <clears throat> there's no question people spend um, less time at a party. I mean, you know, the parties that you and I are used to seeing at so many one design classes, yeah. when you get to those events are usually done pretty early and the teams go off and do their debriefs or mm. they go to dinner with their teammates and all that. And, um, and you're right. I don't, but I think that part between they get off the water till they leave, I think is, is still there. And, and maybe should be encouraged. You know, it's interesting. Some of the J70 regattas that I went to, they really helped to encourage people to stick around and have a beer by doing their debriefs. And they brought the pro, it was kind of cool because they brought the pros in. And I know you've seen this in a lot of classes, yeah. but to get the pros to do their debriefs and talk about what they've learned and all that and stand up there with a beer and have it be informal and have it be fun, I think was successful in kind of bringing everybody together. And you know. I mean, yeah, and it, I think it's it's getting better. I think people are realizing, you know, the industry leaders and the people that are involved, I think are realizing it. So they, I think they are trying to do a little better job and put a little better face on. So I think, you know, there's yeah. there's hope for the future. Yeah. You know, saying going, going back to the thing about the keeping it fun, it's interesting. Our college team, which we were fortunate and proud, did pretty darn well worked really hard and at the same time we made sure and they made sure they enjoyed it they enjoyed the process the minute a practice was getting mundane and you could tell it in their expressions we would call it off matter of fact the three of us would be on the radios talking and if somebody if a number of people would say hey how many more starting drills are we going to do we would start paying attention to that. And yeah. for whatever reason, whether it was something we were doing wrong or whether it was just lousy weather or whether it just wasn't gelling, instead of forcing it, we would we would pull the plug and have everybody going. Because if you're not enjoying it, you're not gonna perform like we talked earlier. And it was funny, I, I mentioned I went to the Pan Am Games as a coach, which was incredibly fun. But it was interesting to be with our, you know, US sailing team members and they too recognize the value of having fun and keeping it light. That doesn't mean they're not busting their hump 200% of the time, but they also are making sure they're enjoying the process and they have that time where they're not focused on sailing and enjoying themselves. And, and it's impressive to see that when they have that mindset, they perform even better or they recognize they perform even better. Yep, I totally understand it. All right, well, here's the last question. What's your best advice for somebody new to sailing, new to the sport, just brand new? Well, one thing that is cool <laughs> um, that this virus has unfortunately brought to a head are, are events like what you're doing, Zane, bringing sailors in to speak about their experiences, you know, what they've learned what might help people learn, you know, and how to improve their sailing. There are lots of um, webinars and many different classes, you know, Quantum North are all doing plenty of, of webinars and for free, you know, mm -hmm. just to help people learn and enjoy, you know, and then you go through the different one design classes that are offering webinars as well. I think, and then there are books out there that are great to get a hold of. And um, I think there's a lot of information to gobble up and try to learn from. And then I also think, and, and I don't mean this because I'm a coach and I love to coach, but I think 
that when you have somebody watching you, not necessarily while you're racing or during a regatta, but watching you sail, helping you improve your game when it comes to the speed part, like we talked about, or the boat handling part, whatever it is, I think that can help you improve immensely in a very short period of time, especially if they're doing video and you're able to review the video with them and all that, it, it, you can really gain from that a bunch. But I think, you know, so many other sports, we, we make sure we put the time into practice. We make sure we put the time into practice with a coach. We make sure that we just, you, you can go out and play tennis and expect to get on the court and just yeah. knock it out of the court park you know by w without spending any time preparing and i think sailing needs that same attention so i would i would just read as much as i could i'd try to grab as many of these webinars and then i would finally the last thing that i think makes a sport special is that there are so many really good sailors out there that are willing to share their knowledge anytime mm -hmm. that to recognize it's okay to go ask them after a race even before a race, in between races, why they did something, what they're thinking about. And, you know, that can help you learn in a hurry as well. Mm -hmm. And plus that makes it that much more fun to connect with those guys too. Yep, I totally agree. I think asking questions is, is to me, one of the biggest things I can always tell people is just ask. Everybody yeah. loves to hear themselves talk, so just ask. Yeah, yeah, so. it's huge. All right. Well, with that, I want to thank you, Greg. This has been awesome, and uh, it's always good catching up with you. So, uh, once again, everybody, this is Zane with uh, Sailing Views. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Get more viewers on here. To help me keep this thing going. So, uh, with that, anything to say to everybody? Or have you said enough, Greg? Oh, no, I'm, I appreciate it, Zane. I think this is really cool what you're doing, and, and I really do appreciate you, me bringing, you bringing me on with you. So, thanks a lot. And uh, again, all right, have anytime. A good one. Yep, anytime. Okay, everybody, this is Zane Salem Views over out and bye bye.